actually now we can see that we are having close to 200 participants so which is by any mean is a huge number and uh, this workshop is being focused on 5g and uh, we have uh, arranged in fact we can say that uh, we have arranged almost to words who's who uh, in this field of 5g uh, basically antenna and microwave and uh, Starting from Professor Satish Sharma to Dr. Devdi Sarkar to Dr. C.J. Reddy to Dr. Vibhudat Sahu and Dr. S. Anuruddhan and Prasad Bhatt and Najim. So they all are experts in their own field and we have nicely curated this entire program and uh, mostly on microwave and antenna application in 5G. And the inaugural talk is going to be delivered by Professor Satish Sharma. So welcome, Professor Satish, uh, for joining us. Uh, I know it is going to be early morning for you, but for us it is evening. So good morning as well as good evening to all of you, those who have joined uh, this wonderful workshop. Uh, with these words, once again, I welcome one and all. And again, request the way Dr. Chandrakant has requested that uh, we are a very small but focused community of antenna and microwave engineers. Those who have uh, not opted for either anti APS membership or MTTS membership, uh, but you reside in Bangalore or in Karnataka, please join our society, either of uh, Antenna and Propagation Society or MTTS. Anyone you join, so you will become the part of. Uh, APMTT joint Bangalore chapter, which comes under uh, Bangalore section. Most of you know that Bangalore section as well as this joint APMTT Bangalore chapter is the most vibrant section as well as chapter in India. Uh, and we do various kind of activities for the benefit of members. And we choose very, very relevant and recent topics rather than uh, again and re again repeating the same thing. So this uh, wonderful workshop uh, on 5G is uh, uh, in that connection only. And we are going to have now our first talk on innovative millimeter wave high gain antennas for enhanced wireless and satellite communication, which is, I think, a very, very apt topic for the inaugural uh, session of this workshop. With these words, again, I welcome our Uh, for joining us. Priya, over to you. You can take forward now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chandrakant and Dr. Puneet, sir. Uh, so now we'll go on to the first talk. But before that, I request Dr. Mahesh to give a brief introduction about the chief guest to the audience. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Satish Sharma, sir. Uh, Satish Kumar Sharma sir is a professor and director of Antenna and Microwave Lab at San Diego State University. He has received the National Science Foundation's prestigious Faculty Early Career Development Award in 2009 and due to RIP 2016 funded by Office of Naval Research. He has also received 2015 APS Harold A. Wheeler Prize Award of the IEEE Antennas and Propagation Society for his co-authored paper on anti-jamming antennas. He served as associate editor of the IEEE Transaction Antennas and Propagation Journal since August 2010. He is as an associate editor of the IEEE Antenna Wireless Propagation Letters. His research lab has capability to place, design, develop, and verify antennas from VHF to millimeter wave, that is 110 gigahertz frequencies. He has published over 250 journal and conference papers and holds one US patent and one Canadian patent on multiple face center feed horn. He has also co-edited three volumes of handbook of reflector antennas and feed systems published by Artec House in May, June 2013. He is another co-authored book, Multifunctional Antennas and Arrays for Wireless Communication Systems will be published by IEEE Press in March 2021. He has collaborated with industry on SBIR, STTR, one and phase two projects funded by DARPA, SPAWER, Missile Defense Agency, 
Air Force Research Lab, uh, in addition to the projects from NSF, Office of Naval Research, and has completed almost $3 million US dollars plus of projects and contracts since 2006. He has also served as engineer consultants with industries such as Kyocera, Space Systems LoRa, Cubic Defense Applications, Tiva Gloss, Direct TV, at and and several other local industries on different antenna projects. He is also a CEO founder of the 5G Antenna Tech LLC, which deals with flat panel electronically scanned page array, utilizing 5G silicon RFICs and automotive transparent antennas. His research interests include microwave and millimeter wave frequencies, beam steering antennas, reconfigurable and tunable antennas, 3D printed antennas, inkjet printed conformal array antennas, Massive MIMO antennas, antennas for cube satellites, and uh, reflector antennas and its feed systems and meta surface antennas. With this, we welcome you, sir. Uh, over to you, sir. Professor uh, Satish. Thank you. Thomas. Yeah. So just uh, just one thing for the participants. You can all put your questions in the Q and A box. Uh, so we will take we'll try to take all your questions at the end of the session. So you can put your questions in the Q and A box. Thank you. Should I start now, Kirti Priya? Yes, sir. You can start, sir. Okay. Thank you. So, thank you very much to uh, Chandrakant and Puneet and Maheshji and Kirti Priya for you all, uh, your uh, words and uh, initiating the stock and workshop there. I think it is very timely to talk about uh, uh, 5G and, uh, of course, uh, um, you know, SATCOM and uh, uh, all other applications. And antennas have been one of the integral components, irrespective of which wa wireless communication we talk about. So uh, with that, I will uh, continue the discussion here. So any research that you do depends upon the resources, right? So you need uh, not only financial resources, you also need some uh, tools uh, and uh, uh, that can be design tools or you write your own codes or you develop uh, your own measurement system or use measurement system somehow. So like uh, uh, starting from simulation tools, um, uh, we have ANSYS HFSS, uh, FICO, Altair. I think you, you will have a talk maybe tomorrow there by Dr. Reddy. And uh, so you, you you learn about that simulation too. Uh, so on, on top of the antiqua grasp, if it is reflector antennas, and if you are uh, dealing with uh, designs, then you have to go and build it before you can say my concept works right. So you do need to verify that. So um, I'm going to start uh, with that perspective. So in my lab, we have two chambers. One is far field chamber here. Uh, that has uh, 800 to 40 gigahertz range. And I have another mini compact range, which was uh, funded by Office of Naval Research that covers to a frequency 26.5 to 110 gigahertz. So basically I have full uh, measurement capability. Of course, many other equipments uh, that we need to perform the research in addition to simulation tools. Uh, while I do uh, various kind of research, mostly depending upon the funding, that I receive and uh, uh, the grants and contracts. Of course, sometimes it's based on the interest of the students because uh, uh, so like uh, I do some uh, STCC, LTCC antenna with the Coursera. Uh, Massive MIMO, which is 5G antenna tech component. Uh, phase tray antennas use beam forming and so therefore, uh, uh, especially with K band 5G frequencies, if you go, you, your uh, not only your cell phone handset has to have beam forming capability as well as the beams will have the beam forming capability. So, uh, so phase tray antenna is one of the important components, of course. Feeder reflectors are there which uh, again can be used from point to um, point to point communication. Of course, for SATCOM is uh, always preferred, uh, you know, designs. Uh, digital beam farming or hybrid beam farming are also present there these days, you know, where people uh, uh, can have multiple beams, basically one antenna structure creates four beam and you can basically simultaneously talk to them like multi-user uh, applications. And there are many more conformal antennas, reconfigurable or tunable antennas. Again, some of the structures that we do most recently, I have been focusing on the 
silicon 5G RFIC based phase ray antennas are electronically scanned array antennas. So in this talk, I cannot cover everything, but I'll be talking about whatever work I have done in the last year, 2019 to 2020. And I will see, uh, you know, I can create some interest and uh, some, uh, and if I would like to answer if any question at the end, of course. So uh, 5G, you know, frequencies can start from sub six gigahertz to, you know, 24, 28, 39 gigahertz bands. Uh, but at the end, these are all, millimeter wave are micro frequencies coming from the antenna point of view you just need to know the frequency specification the gain uh, polarization or other uh, performance parameters in control then it becomes an stand alone antenna design problem and then uh, so thing to note uh, you know what is the application What's the frequency you are operating? What kind of you know uh, what kind of scenario it will be placed? It means you have multi-path scattering or you have line of sight, so you can choose all those things in the in the in the problem domain. So, uh, looking at the five G perspective, you know, yeah, one can say that I have to have line of sight because then only I can, you know, communicate. If I'm working at K band frequencies, if not, I will have lots of you know propagation loss. So 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 you, one has to be aware of all those factors when dealing with those things. Of course, uh, a millimeter wave to microwave frequencies plus you want to minimize, uh, you want to minimize number of antennas uh, so that uh, at the same time you have may, many more applications covered. Uh, uh, so what I show here, just a sim sample here, if one goes back to conventional antennas of reflectors, Certainly, they can provide you very high gain, and uh, they are very robust. Uh, they don't provide much beam steering, of course, or, or if they provide beam steering quality, or beam steering gets bad, or drop in gain is much more. They are bulky. Compared to that, a phase ray antenna, which is, again, the need for the mobile terminals, as well as for the, uh, you know, start come applications, you know, so where you want uh, keeps uh, you know steering your beam, they can provide reasonable good gain. Uh, of course, you do need plus minus 45 degree to plus minus 60 degree beam scan. You prefer planar so that they can be you know low profile, but they tend to be costly and they do need you know other uh, complex beam farming networks. So both antenna types are the reflector or phase ray they are good candidates but then they all have their pros and cons and that applies to any of the antenna categories so in this talk i'm going to first start with reflector antenna and feed sources uh, uh, as uh, you know you know maybe it was mentioned earlier uh, i have published some books uh, you know on feeder reflector with some of my co-authors uh, you know uh, uh, from, uh, uh, you know, here in North Grumman Corporation, as well as from the Institute of Manitoba. And uh, those working in the reflector field, uh, I hope you may have used these books some point of time. I developed many of those, uh, you know, field reflector that I show here as part of the different projects. I'm, I don't want to talk about that, rather I will go back to the first thing where we design an antenna for CubeSat application. Now, CubeSat application is a, uh, you know, again, very hard topic coming from the, uh, 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 that you, you want many more CubeSat in space. And of course, you want to check the weather, you want to have uh, another applications. Uh, so what we show here uh, is 3U or 6U kind of CubeSat, uh, uh, which can do uh, cloud, uh, precipitation, topography, or other remote sensing applications, you know, and uh, we are choosing W band frequency because in that range, you know, uh, the propagation loss is reasonable uh, low. So, so that's one reason we chose that band. At the same time, wavelength will be small, so we can have more bandwidth, you know, at, at the cost of the frequency that we gain. So. We needed, since it is a feed reflector antenna design, we needed one one uh, U space. One U means 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter space, basically for the antenna design. Uh, uh, so we need very compact design. So considering the frequency, we can have some 28 
of wavelength, uh, uh, you know, diameter reflector with f over d of 0.25, basically it's very uh, co compact design. Uh, feed is Epsilon circular polarization, so the you know uh, reflector can provide right hand circular polarization of again around 34 dBi. Uh, overall goal was to have 20, 200 megabits per second, you know, uh, data transfer. Of course, the antenna we design provides much more than the, the requirement of 200 megabits. Uh, this work published in uh, Triple Transaction. March 2019. In case you want to read more about this, so uh, I will, you know, continue now. Uh, if you are designing a, a circular polarization, certainly you are starting with uh, one linear. Let's say linear pol polarization comes here. You want that out the output. You want circular polarization. So the physics is that if you have one linear coming, there are uh, cavity pairs here. And uh, by arranging them properly, you can create phase delay or time phase difference of 90 degree and equal amplitude, right? So uh, you can have E and uh, between the two directions of same amplitude with 90 degree phase. So that's what we show from here also 0 degree 90, 180, 270, basically how field is rotating. That makes, uh, uh, you know, the you know, circular polarization happening over a wide frequency range. And uh, in this case, we use nine pairs of the, you know, air holes. Uh, they are not too deep, at, but at millimeter wave frequencies, 86 gigahertz. Uh, the fabrication uh, is very really challenging. So we used custom microwave INC here in uh, uh, Colorado. They built it for us, of course, at a very high cost uh, uh, price, and they still they give us good academic discounts. But point is, I'm trying to make fabrication is very challenging if you go uh, such designs as the as the frequency is increasing to such levels. So uh, before we built it, of course, we tried to put some uh, ground skirt on that so that the, it can equalize the cut on the on the structure, and and we have all the uh, you know input excitations. You know, for the wave wave guide point of view, and then we have this is the polished, uh, you know, reflector uh, with uh, you know, ten centimeter ten centimeter aperture that can provide the gain around thirty four dBi with f over d of 0.25. So uh, this shows the impedance matching uh, from the eighty to eighty eight. 86 gigahertz, 87 gigahertz range, and it can see you can see the axial ratio is very uh, good, around 1 dB both simulation and measurement. And uh, we have since we have millimeter uh, wave chamber in uh, you know in my lab, we could verify all this data. So, so um, point is again simulation is is one 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 is good start, but then you have to build and test those things. Uh, you also need to look at the uh, contour plot for the axial ratio uh, so that it's not only one angle uh, where axial ratio is good. And you can see here we have simulation versus measurement plots uh, for two frequencies, 79 and 86 gigahertz. And axial ratio is fairly good, you know, in, in the area where we have a, a blue color that you see on the screen. That confirms that the quality of circular polarization is very good over a broad angle and also with uh, the P angle. So it's kind of full, you know, uh, 360 degree versus the angle variation. And that's when you can see it's my feed source is very good. And once we've tried that, uh, we also looked at the pattern, both from simulation and measurement, uh, 3D measurement data, as well as the 2D cuts. And uh, we do see little change in a compared to the simulations. But the quality of the meter, uh, meter pattern is very close to simulations. Uh, you need to see that if the feed is properly illuminating the reflector surface. So you have to either use whatever full level analysis tools you use. You have to see that you are not spilling energy beyond the reflector. So here from this animation, we show that that the illumination is uh, in good control of the not much spillover energy happening considering that it is f over d of 0.25 uh, reflector and we have the uh, half edge illumination of 10.5 dB in this case, uh, you know. 
uh, we also looked at the reflector pattern, uh, you know, after measurement, uh, you can see that uh, we do have some spillover happening based on the offset arrangement and FOD 0.25, uh, but then they all are uh, in good control. You see the uh, peak gain, uh, you know, and the, uh, you know, the antenna efficiency, uh, you know, peak gain is something around, you know, 34 dBi range and uh, antenna efficiency around 60 plus percent, I will say. And, uh, you know, we also showed the measured 3D pattern from the reflector. But since it is going to be in CubeSat application, we have to also verify if uh, a, how it works in the CubeSat chassis. So if you, we did model like, uh, you know, CubeSat 6U, uh, you know, uh, chassis there, you can see the antenna is sitting in uh, inside that. And then um, we, uh, and ANSYS HFSS, as well as uh, LDI FICO, and many of these two, some asymptotics methods there. So they do have this capability to model. Of course, TKR HFSS also have this capability. So any software you use, they have this capability to model the whole structure and see that they all work, uh, you know, as one piece. So we did verify our, uh, you know, uh, simulation measurement uh, you know, data, you know, from all these aspects before we qualify the antenna. So the uh, one of the purpose of showing this antenna was that the, that not only we need a wide band circular polarization, we need a good quality circular polarization. And that's where sometimes people only verify a few phi angles, phi zero or phi 90 degree planes. And then at other angles, the quality of circular polarization degrades very rapidly. So that should be kept in mind, uh, you know, design. We also designed some 3D metal printed. Again, that's the, the point I'm bringing this 3D metal printing because that brings you low cost fabrication. Machining is very costly. Having said it, 3D metal printing does have some fabrication tolerance problem. So if the fabrication tolerance are within control, 3D printing can provide you low cost, uh, uh, you know, structures. Of course, with the metal alloy, they huge. So what we did in this example here, we used a, we designed a K band, you know, uh, in a feed horn, simply covering from 26.5 to 40 gigahertz. And uh, we have actual, uh, sorry, axial corrugated horn here in this uh, shown here. And we also built some polarizers. I will talk about both, uh, you know, polarizer and V-band, uh, you know, millimeter wave uh, uh, dual CP horns later on. But before we talk about that, uh, since we use 3D metal printing, it works based on the direct metal laser sintering. And uh, we have some facilities in uh, USA here, Protolabs company, maybe you have something similar in India that you can use to build your structures. And they use some, uh, you know, metallic powder of uh, aluminum alloy. Uh, and then um, they do layer by layer printing. And of course, they do have some tolerance, as I said, like 50 micrometer in XY plane, 125 micrometer in uh, G along G axis and also as long as these, you know, uh, tolerances are in control. So up to 40 gigahertz, we got this, that 3D metal printing works fine. But when we build this millimeter wave design, we have 50 gigahertz, 50 gigahertz range, the 3D metal printing design did not work. So later on, I will show you the aluminum based design because 3D metal printing failed. So from my experience, we have, we can use 3D metal printing up to 40 gigahertz. Of course, you know, uh, and it was only one build. So if you make multiple builds, they claim that they can provide you better tolerance uh, or better smooth designs. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Of course, this came, paper came in uh, and, uh, IEEE Antenna Wireless Propagation later, uh, April of 2020 this year. So if you want to read more uh, about this design and the specs you can get from there. So uh, this actual uh, axial corrugated uh, feed horn, you know, we have simply a, a you know, uh, uh, K connector with uh, with a, a rectangular wave guide that kind of you know excites this horn. Of course, you can see we, have, we are transitioning from circular wave guide to rectangular wave guide at the end there, 
and uh, these corrugations were designed of course with proper you know uh, in proper physics manner uh, you know what you can when you have to be aware of amplitude and phase distribution so that they 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 give you the they give you the quality of pattern and in the paper we talk about all those physics so we also but we have to since we are doing 3d metal printing you have to be aware of the fabrication tolerance so what we do here is the fabrication tolerance study so if we change the tolerance along you know uh, the axis uh, and other uh, uh, you know what kind of pattern degradation can happen and impedance matching degradation can happen so once we verify that uh, the tall fabrication tolerance uh, is not making big dent on the design, that's when you have the confidence to send the um, uh, design for a build part. And once you have received the build, of course, then you can look into the testing and you can see here that the, the, the not much variation we noticed as we change the, you know, the, the fabrications. However, one thing to make here, if you see you know, visually, it looks like uh, there are some, you know, non-uniformities in terms of surface roughness, but again, they are within the tolerance, uh, you know, so, so that did not make big dent. Uh, we did measure that hard in our chamber, and then uh, this is the simulation of such measurement as parameter compression, and uh, you, uh, you can see they do meet the matching bandwidth requirement. Uh, gain is also in uh, you know, good compression between simulation measurement around uh, 14 some dBi. Uh, if you see the uh, you know, pattern at 26.5, both for the, since it is waveguide, you can define E and H plane or phi 0, phi 90 plane. If it is micro strip patch antenna, I prefer using phi 0, phi 90 as pattern descriptors here, but here since it is waveguide, so we good to say E and H. So if you see that there are some cross polar higher than the simulations, but then those are also because of the, we are approaching end of our chamber, you know, you know, spectrum for large is the far field chamber limit. So that's what we did here. So you can see little, some degradation that can also be contributed by the fabrication tolerance, certainly. But co-pole wise, they were very uh, in good agreement. Uh, similarly for 33 gigahertz and 40 gigahertz, uh, you can see again, cross polars are different, uh, a few 10 to 15 dB level. Uh, again, that is the manifestation because of the 3D printing or the fabrication tolerance. And that, so that's the cost you pay. Uh, but otherwise, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's very, very low cost. We, it was $300 for us when we got one printed. Uh, if you are getting mass production, certainly the cost can be much, much lower. And that's when 5G comes to, to help you because this frequency is 5G frequency where you can have both 28 gigahertz and 39 gigahertz you know, bands covered around. Of course, you can with light, again, you can rescale the frequencies if you have, uh, you have missing some frequencies. So after we did that, we also looked into a polarizer because many systems are still using existing linear polarizations and they want to go to CP uh, just because of the, the need, then you can have a simple you know, polarizer in between the uh, you know, linear and uh, feed horn structures. So once again, we use the uh, you know, uh, DMLS method or 3D metal printing method. Again, I talked about in the previous uh, uh, slides, I'm not going to describe more, but you can get this uh, more detail about this in antenna propagation later paper, 2019 uh, December, where we have talked about the whole polarizer design. Uh, we again start with the, seeing the how good uh, circular polarization one can obtain. So we have amplitude and phase a difference here uh, we verify and then we also verify the axle ratio with the fabrication tolerance right if it is a hundred micrometer variation what kind of axle ratio to expect versus the design we are going to build and once we verify that this falls within within the limit then only you have the confidence that if i build it for fabrication i'll be able to receive the the design that uh, you know uh, you know that can perform so quality of axle ratio, again, has to be seen not only at one angle or one phi zero or phi 90 plane, rather it should be seen over the 
complete, you know, uh, 360 degree in a sense, or at least to to cover the different fee angles. So here, what we show, you know, from the, uh, you know, uh, of course, versus the theta angle versus as well as the fee, and you can see that a quality of acceleration is maintained, you know, uh, over the, uh, you know, at least 30 plus minus 30 degree to plus minus 50 degree range based on which frequency we are in over the different fee angles. And that shows the quality of polarizer. Now, if you use this as a part of some feed source, you will have very good quality of circular polarization coming from the feed source. So when you illuminate a reflector, you can maintain good co and cross polarization. So um, this is the comparison here. We show the simulation versus measurement. You can see they are fairly, uh, uh, you know, good comparison between them. And Picture so the three D metal printed in a polarizer. Again, this was done three D metal printed because we got up to forty gigahertz. This technology working and very low cost, a hundred to few hundred dollars only per builds. Uh, once again, we tested in our chamber, and uh, uh, here the simulation data is plus minus one hundred eighty degree, but we measured plus minus ninety degree only. So that's why the patterns, you know, look different, but then the, the, be mindful of the angle information here. So here plus minus 90 is what we show in the measurement. Uh, Axel ratio, you know, uh, again, what we, in the measurement we verified in this case, what about the fee, three fee angles? And since we already verified from simulations that they were in good control, uh, we looked into uh, that and then, uh, Comparison between the simulation measurement pattern, if you see, they are all in good agreement, except the cross polars are slightly higher, means the that's what manifests into the axial ratio close to 3 dB, then we are expecting, we are expecting better than that. So fabrication tolerance does play the role here. And had we done machine the same thing, yeah, it could have been, it could be much better. Now, the benefit of 3D metal printing is that you can have one piece printed. Here, uh, if, it is three, if it is machining, you have to cut it into two pieces. And I will show with weave and design that we have to cut into two pieces because machining cannot be done easily. Whereas with the 3D metal printing, it's all one piece. And then you have not to be worrying about any discontinuity and, uh, and any other problems there. So there is some benefits of going with 3D printing if you can. Uh, that's what the purpose we to verify. So, uh, continuing on that 3D printing versus, uh, you know, machined design. So here we have a, uh, a machined version of the, you know, V-band design. Here, I just, I, sh I told you earlier, we did build a up to V-band 3D metal printed structure, but the quality was not good. So we, we had to go back to machining process. So in this case, our goal was to have dual circular polarization. Now you can have one polarization for transmission and one polarization for receive. Now, of course, not simultaneously, right? They have to be half duplex in a sense, uh, time division duplex. So when you are, it, is, it can be frequency division duplex. Simply you are transmitting at one frequency, receiving at other frequency, you are transmitting at T1, receiving at T2, right? So we have uh, dual polarization in this case here. So if port one and port two are placed, we have a simple polarizing structure there, uh, which is like a, you know, a special shape cavity. And as the wave goes from one port, it gets into two equal amplitude and 90 degree phase difference. When you excite from the port number two, you have the same physics going on. So the same cavity can perform for both polarizations. In the previous example, I showed only one polarization, uh, one sense of rotation in sense of the you know, polarization quality. So once again, we have to verify the amplitude because the quality of CP depends upon how the amplitude you know, uh, gets, uh, you know, uh, and how the phase response. So uh, you can see there is little variation uh, over the frequency range at the same time for phase, it is plus, it's very close to 90 degrees. So that gives the confidence that this, uh, this structure will perform as a good, uh, you know, feed source uh, in, in terms of circular polarization. Once again, this paper, uh, are more detail about this paper, you can read in the Antna propagation letters, November 2020, you know, issue there, uh, where um, I had some collaborate, rather some vision
from China as my postdoctoral fellow, and then his master's uh, student, those who did the work here. Uh, so you can see here, uh, since it's machining, you cannot do one piece. So you have to break into two pieces. So basically, uh, you know, uh, uh, we have to basically, uh, you know, machine them separately and then put through some, you know, nut balls in a sense. So that's the disadvantage. Uh, and that can also have some problem of discontinuity at the junctions, but that's the problem of paint. Versus 3D printing where you don't have such problem, but the fabrication tolerance is still a challenge beyond 40 gigahertz. So uh, once we have built it, of course, we verified this parameter as well as the axial ratio. And you can see that they they are in a reasonable agreement between the simulation and measurement. Again, this machining was not done at the same level machining I got designed for W band frequency. Uh, this was very low cost, around $1,000, uh, you know, again, th from the proto lab, and they have the uh, machining option also. So because they couldn't do the 3D printing, so they say, I will, we can do with that, but then again, charge will be high. The point I'm making is not a very high quality machining. Uh, had we done very high quality machining, the same thing I did for W band, then responses were much, much closer. So there again, when you do machining, how, how good precision you can have, right? Are electro farming. If you go to much higher frequency, you can do electro farming. And electro farming performs much better than any machining, like machining quality that you can, you know, uh, uh, achieve. Or machining quality based designs you can achieve. So uh, here we have the uh, pattern for the simulation as well as the measurement. Uh, and, and you can see that the, the patterns are very in good agreement for both polarizations. Again, I'm just presenting some detail here for more, please read the paper and then you'll get more to learn how we designed or what, what performance parameters, you know, make sense. So with that, I want to close on the reflector side, rather I want to discuss something on the uh, on the phase tray point of view. Uh, again, uh, phase trays are very good, but then uh, they are very costly and then they have very other challenges. So let, let me talk about that. Once again, we start with uh, a W band project where we had some, uh, you know, CubeSat application. So our aim was to have a phased antenna on the one Q of the, uh, uh, you know, cube, six U CubeSat space only. And then uh, we want to close the link. So basically, uh, we had some uh, big reflector antenna on the ground in Navi, and then uh, CubeSat will be you know, 500 to 1,000 kilometer above us. And if we have some 30 dB to 34 dB gain, we can close the link. So so with that in mind, again, the same application of remote sensing uh, in this case. Uh, there are many uh, more projects actually here. Uh, right now I'm involved with another project for lunar mission for NASA. Uh, and when NASA is planning to launch a satellites for the small satellites rather for uh, communication with the lunar surface as well as the gateway and the ground and uh, I'm designing some phase ray antennas for them for K band frequencies and uh, using some RFICs. I'll talk about something related later on. So CubeSats again are very uh, important uh, as far from multiple point of view. Uh, but then choosing the rating element in this case, we since CubeSat application, we don't need full 3D beam steering. Rather, we need 1D beam steering only from space to the, you know, uh, to the ground. So uh, we needed to design a leaky wave antenna, or or you can say series, you know, fed, uh, uh, you know, designs. So uh, rating structure is a new structure, what we named it as new butterfly antenna, uh, where we have uh, four radiators, zero. 90, 180, 270 arrangement, and they are one wavelength apart, you know, so kind of whole unit cell is one wavelength apart. And if you see the current, you can see that you can create 0, 90, 180, 270, rather that gives the circular polarization or some field rotation that you want. Uh, but before we can see how many elements we can have, again, you have to do that kind of trade study first. Uh, uh, people put, generally use one by 16, but we did up to one by 32 and, and one by 24 to see really which one is the best. And if you see the current here, you'll see that 
or if you choose one by 32, the, the lots of is uh, rating element, they don't get enough current. So basically current is dying out by that. So that's not the best, you know, uh, number of elements to use. So rather we prefer using it one by 24 in our design and that offered some 70.5% of antenna efficiency. Uh, all the research you do, you have to support with the proper physics, right? Proper math or whatever you can say to, to make sure it works. So we did look into the leaky wave antenna theory and uh, since we have 24 elements, each uh, rating element to rating element separation is one wavelength. And uh, we have, the, if you look at the, you know, the leaky wave concept, then we have beta and alpha. That are two factors where beta is responsible for the beam angle that you want to get and alpha gives the uh, control of the beam width. So that was our part of design. Uh, once again, that paper uh, I will mention, it came in Atipli transaction and we have all the nice details on the, the theoretical development. Uh, if you somebody has interest in reading and trying to use for any application, you will have the information. So we build a two of that, you know, uh, you know, eight by, uh, you know, eight number of, you know, elements with corporate feed before we can make with the phase three antenna uh, just to see if it provides the fixed beam and we also made a 32 by 24 but what i show here 8 by 24 and they both perform similarly of course so since it is a, a leaky wave antenna you have the problem of uh, beam squint right because as frequency changes uh, your phase will change and therefore you see some squint problem so here is squint uh, with some uh, uh, reasonable squint, the bandwidth is 80.5.2 to 86.3 gigahertz. And if you see the uh, simulation versus measurement axle ratio and the uh, impedance matching, and you can see that within the uh, 85.2 to 86.3 gigahertz range, that's where we wanted to have at least 200 megabits per second data throughput requirement. Uh, we could get proper, you know, acceleration as well as the impedance matching. And looking at the pattern quality at 86 gigahertz, and you can see that simulation measurements agree well. Uh, and same thing, you know, if you verify the gain, you know, was 19.9 dBIC and cross polar was 21 dB. Both the beam width was again, you know, 9.5 degree and 6 degrees in P0P90 plane. Once again, this paper is in the in IEEE transaction early access right now, and we have done uh, all the nice, you know, details and theory. And uh, you know, if somebody is interested, uh, please do read that. For we we designed the beam steering of the same thing by having the uh, LNA, and uh, well, we designed two bit phase shifter for our proof of concept with the silicon germanium approach and uh, after having designed the phase shifter with the we bought commercial on the shelf lnh and uh, we build the whole array and then um, uh, we are uh, you know uh, still testing because one again since it was multi-layer board uh, the one of the component got mirrored and therefore it simply turns out to be brick so we have to re rerun the fab before we can verify this design, the beam steering concept. So I don't have any beam steering response result for it, but uh, but but then uh, uh, fixed beam we, al uh, we already verified again. So again, uh, however, we have some. If you want to some, see some uh, beam string performance about this structure, uh, that's in the uh, paper mentioned there in IEEE phase day symposium uh, that was in Boston last year, 2019. So that, that has some information on that. Uh, I think I have here some information I forget to mention. So we do have some information. You can see that we are scanning the beam over the uh, plus minus, you know, 30 degree for sure, uh, at rather 34 degree to be precise. And we looked into the active base parameter because when you have beam string antenna, active base parameter very critical, which includes a mutual coupling as well as impedance matching. And uh, as beam steers, how axle ratio performs. So uh, it, that is very important to note because quality of circular polarization get worse, you know, uh, as you as you scan. So we did verify those 
uh, you know, parameters, you know, before we can say, yeah, before we build this design also. So uh, now, now let's talk about some actual 5G stuff, uh, actual 5G related stuff that we, the talk is about. So 5G silicon RFICs has been a very new innovation. Analog devices, Anoki Wave, uh, you know, some other companies have designed chips. Those chips have uh, the uh, phase shifters, variable gain amplifiers, and, uh, and power amplifiers, all in one piece with RF switch there. And this very small footprint that can be used below a single radiator. So that's what we have used here. So there are different companies we are mentioning. Some, of course, you know, we uh, we have a paper that just you know came a month back uh, in IEEE Access. There, um, that project was with the Army and Navy Labs here uh, in USA. So the chips uh, are from analog devices, uh, uh, RNSS, as well as Anoki Wave, and some other companies like Mix Mixcom and RF Core. They all are making different chips. What we used in our design was Anoki Wave chips because that's what we have. And of course, we are I'm using uh, analog device chips for other frequencies for uh, Air Force projects. So these chips have different frequency range. Of course, they have different number of channels, basically how radiated radiators you can support with one chip. So they have quad chips. Basically, one chip can be feeding four rating elements. And not only four rating elements, you can have both transmit and receive functionality. That's why they have number of channels there and transmit receive as mentioned here. The challenge is that again, the, the, the way I was saying that earlier that your chips has to have low noise amplifier, power amplifier, and you know, six bit uh, phase shifters and some RF switch there. So basically they are all, all packaged with one small footprint. Uh, you need to have multi-layer boards. And so if you are going to go a 5G antenna and 5G phase ray antenna, especially considering the base station or mobile terminals using in cars, uh, and if you are communicating through the LEO orbit satellites, if you have heard about some one web uh, company and Facebook and other projects, they are launching so many satellites in space. So they can provide you lots of data on ground. And to access those data on ground, your vehicle, let's say vehicle, vehicle applications, you have to have a device that, that can be tracking the satellite as well as connecting and then getting the data communication happening for you. So for that, beam steering is a very important uh, parameter. And, up, and then you don't have much uh, power and then you don't want to use much volume. And of course you want low cost. So there are so many challenges with 5G that comes to play the role because of commercialization involved there. So again, the challenge is that you have to have multi-layer board. Here we have 12 layer boards. And then when you build the boards, you have to be aware of fabrication. Our one board costs $15,000. And of course we want this to be in $10 range to make it commercial product. Certainly when chip prices will go down in a couple of years and the fabrication quality can be done at a mass scale, the prices will be there. But right now, Technology is at the higher end for now. So, uh, and we did look into the how fabrication quality can happen. Again, uh, you have to use LTM based layout things so that make sure everything is in proper place, like a tailoring job, antenna design, and then the beam farming network, right? There are two aspects here. And, and beam farming network is like a, it is a tool for you that up allows the beam steering. And that's where this chip falls in place. So, you have to be aware of that. So we designed this, again, uh, some discussions I cannot also share and uh, what we published, that's what I'm sharing uh, because of the uh, defense nature of work we did. So so after we have the, you know, we designed the board and the, and the aperture, uh, this is the photograph, you know, that you can see that uh, of the radiator with uh, both front and uh, vacuum. Here we have the chip, RFIC chips here. And these are the rating elements. Those were simply stacked patch radiators, not a very fancy thing, just to prove the point. And this works for the 5G band 27.5 to 28.35 gigahertz, certainly. Provides a beam steering of plus minus 45 degree. We chose dual slant linear because most of the basis stations that you have, they are 
45-135 polarization. So when you receive from a cell phone, you don't lose connectivity. So they have slant polarizations. That was our, our requirement in this case. We also did the, some over there data testing to make sure that it does data throughput verification. So we did look into that. Again, the paper I mentioned has all the details. But uh, first we, we verified the beam scan performance and that we did in our chamber. Uh, and you can see that we can scan plus minus 60 degree, you know, with this phased ray antenna and uh, uh, at different frequencies, of course, 30 gigahertz, 26 gigahertz, and then we have 28 gigahertz as well as, you know, uh, uh, based on measurement data or sometimes we have simulation measurement comparison also. And this data simply shows the element pattern because scan volume is dependent upon the wide beam wide pattern, right? How wide element pattern is, that's what determines how far you can scan the beam. So that's what we show here with that uh, uh, graph there, that was the scan volume we are trying to achieve here. And we did have some measurement uncertainty because since we have RFICs, so uh, it's very hard to know how much, uh, you know, how, rather it's very hard to do the calibration uh, uh, to, to get the actual gain because LNA, Again, is there HPA gain? Is there VGA information there? Phase shifters are there? They all are adding up. So it's, there is there is some uncertainty. It's not that it cannot be done, but we have not done actually. We only have some 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 rough estimate versus simulation versus measurement. That's what we say measurement uncertainty in our range here. Uh, for verifying the data throughput, you have to have the you know um, uh, you know proper setup, of course, you know, where you need the, uh, you know, both on the receive side and the transmit side, uh, you know, the, the spectrum analyzer and all the mixers that you want. So, uh, and then after we did that in the whole setup, again, paper talks about all these descriptors. Again, if I, I don't think time is enough to go all in detail, but at least uh, if you put into the, you know, proper setup, then you can verify the data throughput with different modulation schemes, right? So here we have 16 QAM versus 64 QAM, you know, uh, uh, you know, modulation schemes and to see the data throughput. And then we can get something 75 megabits per second, uh, uh, you know, for the for testing the 300 megabits per second link actually, uh, which is basically we can verify uh, a 5G you know, frequent data throughput, of course, the whole whole setup was not the part verifying whole 5G frequency range, rather for some spectrum only. But then, uh, but then uh, we, we could we, we could see the, to the proof of concept here. So, so this is something, you know, after we got that it works out, we also verified some circular polarized KU band, which is again for SATCOM applications, KU band, uh, half CDL frequencies when you are transmitting and receiving. So you need wide band CP. So you have we have done some sequential and sequential or nested sequential rotation basically, and this is using again same RFICs, not rather different model of the same from same company Anokia RFICs, and by this is the front side where we have the aperture and this is the beam farmer network with the SPI control and all the points. You need SPI control all those things because that's how you can control the beam, and you have to have beam farming algorithm for that. So we verified the CP quality for both, you know, uh, you know, uh, LSCP as well as for RSCP because the dual circular polarization. Again, paper talks about all the details. So um, uh, please do read if you want to design uh, all flat panel or phase rays like this, which are very low volume and high performance. But then uh, currently the pub publication cost is limiting them. One last thing I want to talk before I want to end uh, my talk today. Uh, I think I have another 15 minutes, I hope. Uh, so where we used a reflector antenna to do the beam steering. Now if you use reflector antenna to do the beam steering, the problem is that you, you, you have to do some lateral displacement of the feed. If you do the lateral displacement, your gain degrades very rapidly. And that's not good. So, you, and if you have a phase ray antenna on the other hand, you can have three to four dB gain drop as beam scans and you can maintain good performance. So our goal was to design an antenna with reflector 
as well as phased ray kind of a hybrid solution which can give some you know of course some for verification purpose some 25 db again and plus minus 30 degree beam steering so the concept is that if you use parabolic reflectors you have a limitations but if you go spherical reflector or you go cylindrical reflector then you have beam steering option if you have cylindrical reflectors that you can scan in one plane at least you have a spherical reflector, you can scan in both planes, but spherical reflectors do have a spherical aberration problem. So you have to be aware of those. So here, what we did with a simple, uh, you know, reflect, uh, cylindrical reflector surface, like cutting a pipe, water pipe from middle, big, big diameter pipe, and you have one, you know, one, one surface, one half of the cylinder simply. So that's what we have, but we have the, we have phased ray antenna here as our feed source, as our feed scans, uh, and since it is the cylindrical reflector, that's the axis where you see the beam steering. Along the parabola axis, you don't see any beam steering. And so we started with proper math, or uh, rather proper physics, I will say, where we have a line source, we did the, uh, you know, reflector illumination and see that if the, how, you know, aperture illumination happens as you scan the beam versus when beam is at, at the broad side. And after you verify all this concept, then you can go back the design goal of the feed source. Since in this case, again, uh, the, since we are just looking at phased ray antenna in this case to get the uh, reflector performance, so we use simple stacked patch and uh, uh, having the, you know, uh, four by eight array here with again, anokiev RFICs with the phase anokiev RFIC details noted here. That's the chip number AWMF117 when we have different uh, loan wires amplifier and uh, uh, HPA and the phase shifter in fact, the six bit phase shifter. And then uh, again, control of 0.5 dB uh, as, you, uh, as you want. And the chip is 2.5 by 2.5 millimeter only. It's very small footprint chip. And you can get some, you know, 13, 17% bandwidth. And after we do that, you have to, of course, uh, you know, build it and verify the thing. So, you verify the both for the since it's dual pole, X pole as well as Y pole, because chip can support both. So the radiator can support both, of course. And uh, you have to, since phase the antenna, you have to also verify the thermal effects. So we have infrared cameras, uh, you know, from the Navy lab, and we did measure the temperature of the chip, you know, whole array. So it is something around 58.4 degrees Celsius. Uh, you know, so uh, so you don't need separate heat sink basically in this design. Basically, chips are designed in such a way you can eliminate separate heat sinks. Uh, you know, so that's another benefit of these you know phase three antennas. And uh, you need to verify, of course, the uh, you know x polarization versus y polarization. You know, pattern quality as you scan. But that was the phase three performance. Once we have the phase three performance in control, you eliminate the reflector surface, right? And then uh, and you see that if you are able to get the reflector performance. So that's what we verified here with again, co-polarization and cross for X and Y polarizations for both cases. And we could get the uh, gain and uh, beam within control. So um, this is the experimental setup shown here, uh, not in my chamber or the Navy lab chamber. And we have some, uh, this is the photograph of the you know, uh, you know, metal stomp based reflector. Again, metal stomping is very cheap, uh, $500 or something in this case. And this is our phased ray source. Uh, these are some surface mount boards, which was not very nice, you know, smooth surface because of that. But then uh, after you verify, there was good simula good agreement, I will say, between simulation and measurements. And gain of uh, 25 dBi are some that we expected and good co and cross separation we wanted to achieve. And then um, again, please read more about this in this uh, article transactions, you know, uh, rather article open of hand propagation that came only a couple of months back, uh, you know. So if you more details about it. So I think I want to skip uh, these slides, rather I want to just go back to last slide here, uh, where uh, we have a book coming on multifunctional antenna and arrays. Uh, where I have documented some of the work and what 5G and millimeter waves will be requiring, plus different uh, tunable applications, MIMO uh, details uh, from IT, IT Press and Wiley. And um, some interested uh, reading you can get from these papers that I have mentioned there uh, from 
uh, you know, on different topics, uh, starting from IoT and uh, MIMO, as well as massive MIMO, and then uh, some anti-jamming antennas or null steering antennas. So with that, I want to close my talk. Rather, I want to entertain some questions. I don't know uh, how late it is for you guys, but then uh, um, I want to stop here. Thank you, sir. Uh, so participants, you can start putting your questions on the Q&A box. We already have a few questions. Uh, so first question we have is, uh, could you talk about the chambers for measuring these frequencies above these car bands and all, how the chambers will be? That is the first question we have. So, so the chamber that we have, again, you have, uh, you know, Either you can have far field, either you can have a uh, spherical near field or near field, right? These are different uh, possibilities of the chambers. So what we have is the far field and the mini compact. And again, those are very popular ones, you know, for measuring the you know, antenna performance. So let me go back to that slide and maybe it's good to talk after that. So here it is a far field chamber. Of course, you have to maintain 2D square over lambda, right? Are more than two d square or lambda to to have the far field criteria met, where d is the maximum dimension of the antenna, like in this case diagonal, you know that you have that should be the d information, and then uh, if you can maintain that, of course your feed source which rotates, uh, it can in my chamber we can have any 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 if I have continuously rotating basically you can have any rotation plus we have some software from orbit FR or MVG that provides a sense of rotation as well as axial ratio quality measurement. So if you do not have that additional software or resource, then you can do continuously rotating. So you, if you rotate this feed source on this axis, then you can uh, you know, get the quality of you know, circular polarization measurement also, but then that's not so accurate other than in amplitude only, not the phase wise. So sense is not there, but acceleration is there. But if you have the, uh, you know, sense of rotation information, then that's when the whole whole circular polarized antennas are complete. So in our chamber, we have both of that, if that, that, if that was the question. And as far as the, you know, the mini compact range that we have here, you can, you have, we have a feed source here, and this is the reflector surface. And antenna test, you know, is placed here. Simply, since the frequency is very high, uh, you can maintain, you know, parallel plane waves when it comes to the, you know, uh, antenna test. And that's what we have around one feet of quiet zone. Again, that's where you have the amplitude and phase variation in control. Uh, beyond that, basically, we can measure something around 28 wavelength structure at 100 gigahertz, something like that. And you need, of course, proper RF observers all around if, to, to, to have the, you know, scattering in control. If that was the question, if not, let me know. Yeah, I think that answers the question. Uh, so next question is, uh, okay, uh, Professor Ashutosh Kedar has asked that, uh, how did you optimize the beta and leaky wave antenna? Uh, could you please elaborate upon that? So that beta in the in case of leaky wave antenna, of course, you have to, you know, uh, go back to the leaky wave antenna theory, right? Once you go to go back to the leaky wave antenna theory, you know, let me go back again before I can start answering. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you have to, basically I have some backup slides. Let me go there just to be more precise in your answer. You know, I think, yeah. So what we did, of course, first we did the, you know, we model with the ABCD parameters as well as the full wave analysis to see the alpha and beta information, right? And since it's a squint based design, since it is fed array, so we have to see that how your beta and alpha comes there. And uh, if I understand the question correctly, then alpha will give you the, you know, the beam width information and beta will give the beam position information, right? So simply you have to see that if, they f you know, if the, if the uh, information in terms of the, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, alpha, uh, I don't know, I think I have to tell more about that before I can answer the full thing. Uh, 
please read paper about that. I think I think we have lots of details there in the paper itself. You know, just to answer that question in a sentence versus you know giving full answer. So I I, I will skip that answer. Rather, I will say read the paper. Okay. Okay. So uh, yeah, next question is: Can you tell what the, what was the obtained surface roughness with the 3D printed metallic feed structure for the reflector antenna? For the reflector antenna, you know about the, the two reflectors I presented. One was metal stomp structure. One was the uh, one was the millimeter wave, 100, 110 gigahertz. 110 gigahertz uh, reflector surface was completely smooth and was, was done by custom microwave, and they have less than two mil or two mil of surface accuracy. So that two mil of surface accuracy is enough, and they say they have polished surface. That's that, that's good enough. If, except you do electro farming, if you do electro farming, yeah, you can get much better than that. So they are two mil means something around you know uh, fifty micrometers, and of course less than that is always per perfect. Okay. Uh, next is. Uh... Uh, so one person has asked on the silicon RFIC antennas which you showed. So why the different antennas are assembled on board instead of all on a same die with connecting transmission lines? Mm. Can you please repeat the question? Okay, uh, they have asked what is the technology that has been used for the silicon RFIC antennas and why the different antennas are assembled on board instead of all on a same die with connecting transmission lines? They're basically asking why it is not put in a chip form and probably all the antennas. I, I think it is the see. I think the, you are asking in terms of the corporate feed network or something if I'm feeding, you know, rating element to rating element, right? That's when you are doing the, uh, you know, basic designs since in this case we have all the rf components on the back side right and we have to feed through the viage you know from the radiator to the uh, uh, you know the beam farmer network we have viage going on here so they are feeding it the reason we have to do that because of course you have to isolate the uh, any any spurious radiations from the beam farming network right uh, and if you try to put it on the same place where you have the radiators, you don't have enough space. So the chips and the beam farming network, and, up, and on top you have to have the SPI control lines and the power lines and the different you know, other, other things there. So I don't think you can put it on the same layer. It, it, will, be, it, it will be not possible with the phase rate component with 5G RFIs, and that's why this kind of design becomes very complicated. Okay, uh, so next is how do you manage cooling in the flat panel array to manage the heat dissipation? Again, here the since the chips they have this feature that is not they don't generate much heat. Of course, they don't have high power also, maybe 0.25 watt to 1.6 watt or something that range. But then the chips have this property of low heat low problems. You don't need a separate heat sink now. If you see one of the structure I showed, we got some 56 degree temperature. And if that, if you have air flow, right? Or you have, uh, and if you want really to incorporate some, you know, a heat, heat sink to, to dissipate even 50 watt to room temperature. Yeah, then you can have external heat sinks, but, but they, they recommend uh, uh, no heat sink, at, at least from the chip point of view. So I think there is no heat sink requirement. It's not too much heat. However, you can have uh, all metal heat sink antenna structures these days, and I think we are working on one project with Navi Lab, where we are using the radiator as well as the you know radiator for the uh, same structure for the rating element as well as heat sink. So if you are worried about heat sink problem, but I think the chips they are uh, you know designed to have low heat sink problem. So I don't think you have to worry about that if you are using these RFIs. And that's one thing that you can use in the mobile terminal applications and you have without having to worry about big structures or uh, the heat sink as well as, you know, so many other problems that you can eliminate. That's the, that's the purpose of, that's the beauty of the chips actually. 
Uh, so one question from my side, sir. Uh, so when you showed the 28 gigahertz dual slant polarized antenna, uh, you showed that you had uh, uh, done the demodulation of a 64 quam. So that was done in anechoic chamber way or in OTA way, sir? No, it was OTA. It was over the air testing right here. It was simply okay. a, a setup made in the in in the in the lab. You know. So uh, so beyond. Time. So beyond 64 quam, was it possible through over the air or uh, was there any yeah. yeah. We did not have, simply our setup allows only that much. So okay. that's what we did. Of course, you can do, if you have the setup, yeah, you can do that. Okay. Uh, so uh, that's all for the questions today. Uh, so but it was a very interesting talk, sir, which you can see from the participants have remained about 200 throughout the entire talk. So that shows how interesting the talk was. So I invite Dr. Sudhakar Rao is here actually. He was uh, here listening to your talk. So I invite him to say a few words. Uh, Dr. Sudhakar Rao. Hi, Satish. Hi, how are you, Dr. Rao? Yeah, I woke, I woke up early to hear to your talk. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And I have no electricity in my home today. I'm working with candles because again, high wind Santana, Santana oh. winds power Still? out it. <laughs> more than a week yes yeah Start. no it came back it happened again since yesterday night oh okay so i'm working with hot spot and just to complete the stock <laughs> you're, on the, you're on the wrong side of california yeah i think it moved to la yeah <laughs> hey uh very good talk and uh yeah i just wanted to listen to the talk uh, because we're also working on uh, 5g and beyond 6g mm -hmm. but uh my comment is actually not many people are working in this area, especially mm -hmm. in the universities. People do yep. phase arrays by themselves, they test the patents, but uh, industry is doing some developing chips, but uh, there's nobody who combines both together. And uh, as, a, as a university, I think you're doing an excellent job uh, in looking Thank at you. product uh, rather than uh, individual uh, uh, pieces. I think uh, that's, that's very good. Uh, I think my question is, I think we're looking actually similar application, but uh, beyond 5G. Mm -hmm. um, we did this uh, phase array and reflector comparison, and you showed actually one case, uh, cylindrical reflector with uh, phase mm -hmm. array. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the problem is phase arrays, I think, are good. I think they're, um, they can scan, and uh, but the cost is high, uh, dissipation is high. Uh, and they're limited in terms of uh, capacity, whereas reflectors uh, has um, no scan loss, that's an advantage, much cheaper, uh, low dissipation. Um, so I think I was wondering why you went to cylindrical uh, with a phased array, because you're, uh, you're not reducing the cost at the same time you're uh, uh, complicating a bit more, of course, uh, you can use small phase array. I think that it's fine. But in yeah, instead of that, why can't you use a parabolic reflector with a fixed feed? And uh, now actually gimbals are available, which are very cheap. You can uh, you can procure them at uh, uh, about less than $1,000. Uh, they can scan very well, I think plus minus 90 degree. Uh, the gimbals can move, so there's no scan loss. So, and at the same time, you can actually increase the bandwidth because the uh, feed, you can have uh, multiple bands. So I mm -hmm. think that, that's, uh, uh, of course, they're limited. You can't use in uh, uh, small satellites or in space, but on the ground, I think they're a good candidate. So any comment on that? Yes, yes. So actually, the, the, that's a very good comment. And if you have the uh, gimbal-based, you know, reflector antenna for beam steering approach, I mean, one thing is the vibration, right? I mean, over the time, the, the gimbal have mechanical vibration and so many other problems. So that's why Navi had an interest to replace those gimbal structures in their design, especially for some applications. I can, I'm not aware even what their intended application was. So I had this, you know, work from them, uh, from uh, uh, some funding from. If we have heard about fabric program from AFRL, so yeah. they wanted to steer the. You know, at the same time, they want phased ray based approach, so they don't want to worry about any 
mechanical vibration. I completely agree with you. If you go back to develop the phase ray, cast is there, then at the same time, little heat. I don't think heat sink is a big problem here because uh, it's, it's, as I showed, it's only 50 degrees Celsius. And if we have little, you know, if, if you want to, you are worried about that, you can have little heat sink on the backside. That, that, that will do the job. It's not the heat sink bigger problem. It's the mechanical vibration. At the same time, you want electronic beam steering. So if you have a, a reflector a feed so based gimbal based approach beam steering versus phase ray, then you have you, you don't have to worry about that problem. Simply, especially it may be maybe the platform may be also rotating, right? A whole whole aircraft or let some structure that has own vibration on top. You have the gimbal based vibration. So there may be some problem. That's where they interest they were interested in this kind of solution. And that's what our my approach was to prove the concept that yes, you can do the beam steering. Actually, uh, NASA has already invested some work on that. So uh, you know, and then uh, people have done some work. So it's not something uh, that people have not looked into when it comes to reflectors for beam steering, where they use phase ray as a feed source. But none of them built it. So we have been able to build it. And of course, in your own, uh, you know, different organizations, I think have done, they have done dual reflector based uh, approach for beam steering with the phase ray source. So there have been some work uh, really where the cast will come to play the role. I'm sure after the mass production and if the cheap prices go down, it will be attractive. For now, yes, uh, a reflector feed with the gimbal may be better solution. Yeah, I, I think the vibration is not an issue if it is enabled because they have gyros, gyro mechanism. So mm -hmm. gim, uh, vibration is not a problem. On the ground also, it's not a problem because I think it's fixed. But I think on the spacecraft and uh, satellites, I think it could be, but I think that could be mm -hmm. controlled as well. But anyway, I think this is uh, early stages, but uh, if you want to go beyond 5G, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. Question is, you need more uh, power as well through phase arrays. So definitely, that's an issue. Then the uh, dissipation and other things might be. So, so let me answer on that. I mean, the, for my NASA project that I'm developing the phase ray using same 5G silicon of RFIC at, at the 30 gigahertz frequency, basically. Okay. Uh, we are using same, uh, I mean, Anokia RFICs, and they are okay even on CubeSat. It's a small set, and they are only depending on the solar panels to generate the electric, you know, the, the power. Uh, and they, and we can do at least thousand, uh, you know, element based phase rate design, 24 by 24 to 32 by 32 range. That's our target to close the link between the small set to the lunar, to the gateway to the ground. So, so I don't see the Again, uh, it's one point, let's say 1.26 watt right there. And how many watts we can get with some 30% efficiency. So solar panels are enough. So I think if, if NASA can take care of that with the small side application, I don't see power is a constraint. It's just the cost. I think the barrier is the cost. Not anything else. Heat sink is not a barrier also, in my opinion, of course. You know, and your points are well taken. Okay, thanks, Satish. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Rao, for joining with us today. Uh, so if any of, yeah, so Dr. C.J. Reddy is there. He also wants to say a few words. I think Dr. C.J. Reddy, if you can go ahead. Uh, thanks. Um, uh, hi, Satish. How are you? Uh, hi, Dr. Reddy. How are you? <laughs> I specifically uh, asked for this link so I can join the, your talk. Uh, very excellent talk. Thank I learned you. a lot. Uh, some of the things, you know, we don't pay, I mean, myself don't pay too much attention, but um, this is a nice talk. One, maybe a little bit off for topic here, maybe like the the slide you're showing now, where you show the current mm -hmm. density, where we mm -hmm. have on the left-hand side, broad side, you can see that the current is completely illuminating the mm -hmm. uh, reflector, right? And the, on the right-hand side, it is kind of off to the edge which mm -hmm. could cause the diffractions from the edge, right? Yes, and that yes, could correct. cause the back lobes and other kind of things to go up. Mm -hmm. um, in the compact ranges, that, that they also use reflectors, which you know, I'm working on it uh, in terms of simulations-wise. They use various techniques like serrated edge and blended rolled edge to mm -hmm. minimize the diffraction. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you thought about that approach um, in these cases? So 
No, because the the Navy wanted that whole structure to be not more than 50 centimeter. That okay. was their limitation. Uh, we did uh, in the we did up to 75 centimeters. So basically, if you increase the reflector dimension, that you can get more gain because of more mm -hmm. aperture. Then mm -hmm. you can eliminate the problem of spilling up the energy at the edge, and you can mm -hmm. see that there at the edge, if you go, beam gets more broader, right? And that shows what you yeah. are what you are concerned with. Uh, having yeah. given the freedom, yeah, we will put some of those in our design. But again, if all based on what is specifications you are, you know, given, right? Mm -hmm. So they want very low weight. So it was aluminum. And we did actually 3D printed uh, a surface also, but that got to, you know, bad electroplate, copper electroplate. So we went to aluminum based, you know, metal stomp structure. So yeah, okay, okay. I think the weight, weight as well as the dimension was a constraint from Navy. So that's why you couldn't do that. But yes, you, mm -hmm. you are right. Yeah. So the other way people do that is also with the resistive um, strips and things like that, so they can absorb the edge waves so that there's no diffraction mm -hmm. going from there. And again, so, so the second question I have, I guess, uh, that is, interestingly, you presented the waveguide components that are fully fabricated in 3D printing, that means someone yes. could do this aluminum 3D printing, right? Aluminum as a material or yes. uh, some metallic mm -hmm. material, I guess, as a material. Um, mm -hmm. I'm curious, I guess, which company or equipment that was used? Was it used internally in your lab or did you go outside to get it uh, printed? Uh, actually, uh, we've contacted Proto Labs. Okay. Uh, and there is another company, oh, Geometry. Okay. They all have these mm -hmm. resources. Actually, there are 3D metal printers. I have in my lab a 3D printer also, but those are for small applications with not okay. so much high accuracy. So here we went to Proto Labs and they charge very little money. I will say for this kind of design, machining quotation I got was $4,000. And when you got okay. 3D printing, it was few hundred dollars, three to four hundred, four hundred dollars only. So we said, let's do that. And accuracy is good, you know. So, so I, you know, and I showed you where we paid the price in terms of the cross polar, ten to twelve dB yeah. range. So, if it is not a big sensitive design, cost is in control. Plus, you know, uh, it's lightweight because of aluminum, and all one yes, print. Yes, yes Satish, very nice to be here. Can I add yeah, a bit? Yep, yep, please. Hey, CJ, I think your question is good. I think uh, current technology using uh, aluminum, uh, uh, magnesium, and zinc alloy uh, mm. uh, is uh, a bit lossy and it has some problems with RMS. Mm. So there's a German company which they do only metal. Uh, they have mm. a different alloy which seems to be much more uh, less lossy. At the same time, you can uh, much more smooth it. So I can give you some details later, but uh, it costs a bit more a three D printer, but I think it's uh, it can actually print a larger size as well. So very good. Very good. I think the reason I'm it. asking because I'm also working with a company called Optomec. They do this, you know, very uh, fine um, yeah. um, aerosol jets, I guess, uh, to get these kind of metallic things. Um, I'm just curious about that the process. I guess. Yeah, there's advanced alloys, I think, being developed. I think uh, good yeah. thing with these German companies, they're, uh, good, uh, they're good in metallurgy as well. Mm -hmm. So they're developing new alloys to make the 3D printing more uh, accessible and uh, cheaper. Very good. Very good. Yeah, yeah there is some. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I don't want to take too much time. So thank you very much, Satish. Very nice thank talk. You. Thank, you. Uh, thank you, Sudhakar, for your comments as well. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Rao, and thanks, uh, Dr. Reddy. Yeah, thanks, Satish. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Reddy sir, Rao sir, for joining us today, and uh, in track. It was a great start for the workshop, I'd say. Uh, thank you all the participants for staying with us till now. And uh, for you all, we will be sending a feedback form at the end of the workshop. So it will be sent to only those who attend these sessions. So once you fill the feedback form, you will be given certificates directly. So that is how it is going to be. And tomorrow, uh, next uh, next talk, we'll have tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. So that will be a different link. Again, you will be getting the link in May. So please join there in that link. Uh, so I think we can close for today. Thank you so much, uh, Satish sir, uh, for joining. Yes, uh, sorry to interrupt. Chandrakant here. 
Sure, sir. Yeah. Uh, can we have a photo? Uh, can we request uh, Chatish Sharma and uh, Dr. Reddy and Dr. Rao to switch on your video feed, please? If it's okay. Okay. So yeah, let me. Uh, we discard this and then see can see how I can. Uh, I don't use this tool, so let me see how I can. You know, look into turning on video. Yeah, I think that's one. In the bottom uh, of you your screen, the there will be a, yeah. And nice to uh, see you, Dr. Rao, Dr. Reddy. Hi, uh, Chandra Kanta. Bye bye. So, oh, I have not switched on my video. Sorry. Yeah. I have to still looks like turn on my video, right? So if uh, can you see me? Or the no? Bottom uh, bottom panel of your screen, there will be some mute button. Then audio broadcast, uh, stop video, start videos. That sort of screen will be there. So how, if I'm just trying to see how I can go to that screen actually. Yes, sir, he this have one. Electric, so he cannot see. No, no, I can, I can, you know, but little bit of morning is happening. So, you know, but then I just want to turn on, you know, uh, I don't know, actually, to be honest. About I don't Kirti see. Kirti Priya. Kirti Priya, Kirti Priya, Priya. Oh. Uh, I think. Okay. Mute. Yes, yeah, share. Watch. Oh, I can now. I can see now, I think. Do you see yeah. now? Uh -huh. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes. Oh, okay, yeah, it okay, has Yeah, that's good. It's Priya, is it? No, I'm just trying. Yeah, I'm saying there's some issue with my camera. For <laughs> okay. Do you want to hide? <laughs> uh, no, there, I'm trying that, but there is some issue with connecting with my camera. Yeah, the host. Okay. <laughs> How can we have so, a picture without the host? <laughs> okay, one second. Let me have some light here. So I have this light here, flashlight. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I have the flashlight yeah, now. Flash I have a flashlight now. <laughs> now you are shining. I hope shining electricity will come through. Yeah, now I'm shining. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so Dr. Reddy will be having you soon. And uh, uh, Dr. Rao, uh, thank you very much for joining so early in the morning. So it's no, I have to learn something. So I have to learn something from the experts. So I thought I learned something. <laughs> okay, that's a, that's a different point. I don't want to comment on that. So we all are here to learn from all of you. So uh, today, one part we could uh, slightly we could get some motivation from uh, Dr. Sharma, Professor Sharma. So with this, uh, I hand over to Kirti Priya to formally close the session. I hope you have taken your photo, sir. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so thank you all for being here. Uh, so see you all tomorrow in the next sessions. So please join us and please keep joining with us uh, till the end of uh, the workshops. Thank you. Thank you Bye. very much and uh, good night for all Indian participants and uh, very have a good day for the uh, participants from the US and there. Thank you. Thank you for yeah. having me Thank here you. and uh, you all have a nice time and good night. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye. Yeah.